Santoria Mahambres Guvana Rasusa Santa Balatecos Ketabi Elo Mosantos Kabai Latoba Ibro Kemba Sute Ekepatula Kabelatua Lando Rodobos Cotebres Gavasanta Rapa Santa Branta Babola Kabalata Embra Marsota Blasketa Balaito Kombelata Shovela Lapa Kumpreske Zaleta Maka Presko Lamasika Preso Zanata Payatom Preska Pato Balatuaba Raha Jesus Jesus Mendo Robo Sobre Hali Labro Santa Mabose Naika Brantame Maya la bonza nata frasca ta curia basica pretonda ma la bala basuke Jesus Jesus Robe si sasa non tali hebra conta Maya balatos che pre su saba caparata Monja i cocombre scapo da ricas che pre Boros che ta mina hali Raso kapate no komba santa baboria Leko zese maha zahilatwa Prisko ta mensola Prakenta alima mahaita Oh we give you praise We give you glory We thank you because of the assurance That you will teach us your way So that we can walk in your paths Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And tonight we ask that that sweet, quiet presence of yours might rest upon this congregation like the dew of the morning time. And by it, oh God, let grace be released. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let the spirits of men know the sweetness that resides in your presence. Oh, we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus was teaching and he said these signs shall accompany them that believe in his name. He said in his name they will speak in new tongues. In new tongues. In Kayanus tongues. Uh, from the linguistic perspective, the emphasis there is not the newness of the vocabulary, but the freshness that the utterance produces in your spirit. It's talking about ventilation. Hallelujah. Ventilation. You will find, for those of you that know the art of tapping pan wine, Hallelujah. The fresh palm wine has a stronger propensity to contain alcohol. It, it intoxicates easily. Uh, so, uh, the word used there is fresh when the alcohol or the palm wine stays over for like two days and it loses that freshness. Alongside that freshness, several other properties that it sustains only in fresh mold will be lost. Have you ever had this experience before you just realized that you were dry in the spirit? Or maybe you became conscious of the fact that you were lonely. Is it a recent experience? 
you felt a dryness. Or you, you took notice that you were lonely. These are evidences that you have been starved of the presence of God. A man that knows the presence of God has been delivered from the possibility of, of loneliness. Loneliness is not a function of the absence of people. It's an evidence that you have been away from the presence of God. And it happens to be that the natural habitat that God ordained that humankind will exist and flourish is the presence of God. Of God. So those evidences reveal that you have wandered out of the scope of your true habitat as ordained by God. If you dwell in his presence, there is a freshness that saturates your entire being. Hallelujah. That freshness is a great blessing. Jesus said they will speak in new tongue, they'll speak in fresh tongue that has the ability to impart new vitality to their spirit, new kinds of ventilation that you experience in God. Because many people say, ah, you speak in tongues today, you speak in tongues tomorrow. You don't know that that is the access route to the freshness, the newness. Hallelujah. Amen. There is a freshness that comes with the morning season, morning time. That has the capacity to impart his own hope into the heart of everyone that is seeking appropriately. May God never allow us to go stale in the spirit in the name of Jesus. Because when you go stale in the spirit, several things will be happening and you will not be aware of them because you have lost contact with the dimensions of God that can only be sustained in freshness. Turn your Bible with me quickly. That's, a, that's an admonition from the Lord. Don't allow your vessel become stale. Many things can go wrong in a few days of staleness. Many things can go wrong if you devise a technology to sustain and survive in the midst of that loneliness that you feel. The loneliness is supposed to be an indicator of the fact that you have not been within the scope of your habitat for some time. And if you are not in the scope of your habitat, like the fish, when you take the fish out of water, death doesn't come to it instantly. Death as a process begins to administer its protocol because the fish is outside of its habitat. For those that know God, they know that his presence is the habitat that he has designed that we should function. And that is not a place, that is not an environment that you will want to um, go away from for a long time because such a conduct is going to expose you to dangers. It is a great privilege to sense his presence and to receive ventilation from the richness of that presence. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 10. So we look at a scripture. Acts chapter 10 happens to be the presentation that Peter brought to unbelievers, people that have not been taught about Jesus. An event had taken place and Peter was compelled. He, was, he found himself in a circumstance where he will have to bring perspective to the experiences that the man and his family has had, a man that has no knowledge of the doctrine of Christ. It was a great responsibility that he was saddled with to bring perspective to the experiences that this family had had under the influence of the directive of God himself. So he was trying to Ah, it was a great effort. I see his effort. It was almost, there was no foundation. The people did not have any reference. They had no basis of understanding the things he was about to say. In fact, the reason why they, they even called him to the scene of the event was because the angel of the Lord so directed. 
it's not as if they have been having subsequent or uh, consistent angelic encounters. By way of divine providence, this angel came and encountered the chief man of that house and gave him a directive. There were dimensions that the angels could not carry. He, it was not given unto the angelic to enter into those dimensions because even in the administration of the kingdom of God, <clears throat> There are many things that angels are not allowed to peep into, many secrets that they do not know. And if angels are going to learn those secrets, they will learn them from you. It happens to be that in the organogram of the kingdom of heaven, man shares in many privileges. The only privilege that we do not share in God is that we do not become part of the Godhead. Uh, hallelujah. We are partakers of his life, the same life that makes God God. In redemption, he has made it available to us. We are partakers of the divine nature. So we are supposed to be miniature expressions of, of God upon the face of the earth. We are also partakers of the dominion mandate. The dominion mandate is not something you just assume. It is something that comes from a certain kind of life form. You don't need to teach a dog how to bark because... Backing is part of his life form. If he lives properly, he will stumble upon the ability to back. And, and if you are a partaker of the divine nature, it's God's nature to, to, um, to manifest dominion, to walk in dominion. So you become a dominion, a, part, a partaker of the dominion mandate just because you are connected with this life stream that powers God himself. So many privileges available to us as believers. Hallelujah. However, however, in the midst of all these privileges, I would like you to understand because of our privileged position in the kingdom of God as functionaries, there are many things available to us that are not available to angels. If I had time, I would have taken us to the book of First Peter to show us um, several things that Peter said. His book, I just started reading um, the epistles of Peter to find how rich and how deep God's work in the life of that great apostle was. He, he said, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation, he said, the prophets have searched diligently. When and what manner of time that the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify the Bible says those were things that angels desired to look into. Angels were denied access into the realities of the privileges that God has granted unto us New Testament saints. So even though an angel was sent to Cornelius to minister to Cornelius, there was a limitation in that which the angel could minister. And he had to give a directive to Cornelius to summon Peter. Peter will take it from that point into the very heart of the economy of God. And when Peter came, there was a major challenge because the guys that he was supposed to educate and bring them to a point of knowledge so that they could receive what God was offering, that their disalignment in knowledge and expression of faith would not allow them to appropriate, he had to take them on a journey, a lecture. And I'd like us to see the heartbeat of that lecture that Peter was compelled to bring in order to um, establish a foundation upon which they could access God and receive that which God was offering. And that's why I recommend that we turn to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. If you are still here, say, Amen. Amen. In Acts 10, from verse... 36, you begin to see he had talked about so many things. He had, he had given expression to his observation. He said, ah, God is no respecter of persons. That was what he observed when he showed up. He had exalted God in his heart for his own style, his own method, his own approach, his own model of establishing his will upon the face of the earth, which is contrary to that of man. And he was just discovering today on a very practical note that God is no respecter of persons. Those were his personal observations. But the message he came with began from um, Acts chapter 10 from verse 
36. This word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. This word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. You see, this, this word was not available. It was not something that flooded the whole city in the days of John the Baptist. When the ministry of John the Baptist was coming to a close, on the strength of, of the, the rise of the ministry of Jesus, there were whispers in the whole of Judea all about Galilee. There was a message. There was something that was upon everybody's lips about the ministry of Jesus. And he wanted to bring that word because that word was not a secret. Whereas there were many secrets in the kingdom of God. At this point in time, this message was not a secret. And what exactly was that word? Hi. There's something I missed now. So get back to your own ministry. Jesus. Uh, you see, I need to get what I miss now. So let's leave that message and pray for five minutes. There's, there's an emergency. Now, don't pray in the flesh. Don't, don't be... Don't pray in the flesh. Don't waste your tongues. It's one of the ways that God has given us, one of the blessed ways by which we can gain ascendancy many times when God comes to his prophets he will say come up here where you are I cannot condescend where you are is a place I can't visit the level you want to operate is not consistent with my nature if there's going to be any change then it's up to you come up here come up here make the migration make the move hallelujah ah sila mahala boko salanto Ibrahim Siko Barahari. Oh, you are beautiful. Glory to God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Are you still here? I say in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. According to the Bible in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 38, that's where we see the word. This was not a secret. In the time when Jesus walked this world, everywhere he went, he left whispers upon the, 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 the tongues of men. And this, if you put all the whispers together, it will form what uh, Peter summarized in the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 38. They say, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That was not a secret. With the Holy Ghost and with power. There were many things in God that you could do in secret but to administer the anointing is not possible for you to administer it in secret so because of the anointing the fame of Jesus spread about all Judea people in Judea they were not his relatives but they knew about him even though he was not conscious of what they were saying but what they were saying about him was consistent what was the news what was the gist what was the gossip it was what how God <laughs> anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth you, see, you can be doing your Christianity on low key, low form, low fo format, uh, hidden prayers. You climb mountains for prayer, for fasting. But if, if, it, if it comes to pass that God puts an anointing, all of Judea, suddenly, as much as you try to conceal what you are doing, your efforts will be abortive because the anointing is not something that administers its protocol in secret. The implication, the effect of the anointing causes the fame of the Christ to be spread abroad. He said all of Judea was inf infected by the influence of his anointing. And he said, you know about this matter. This kind of talk began after the baptism which John preached. And what was the message? How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about? The word went about. There is the English word for philanthropy. Because he had received a deposit. He became a philanthropist of grace. 
And if he goes here, he spends a little grace. He squanders some grace around. He finds a, a crippled man. He squanders some quanta of grace. And the man receives the ability to walk again. What he did by the anointing was public. Hallelujah. He went about. Doing good. Meanwhile, his prayer time was in the caves on the mountain tops. Great while before day, Jesus goes out and he begins to pray. But the, when the anointing came, the anointing could not hide. It was in the marketplaces. If there was a burial procession and people were singing hymns to the gravesite, and then Jesus just comes and that anointing begins to, oh my God, he, he ends the procession because of the anointing. And everybody in the whole of Judea knew that God has invested something on the life of a man. How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing what? Good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. I remember I have a testimony. For about 12 years, I, I operated as a teacher in Sunday school. I teach, I teach in Sunday school. I teach in discipleship. I teach here. I teach there. And all of that, most, most of, of that was in secret. Because most of you didn't know me when uh, I was doing my, my teaching. It was quiet and humble. I remember when I went for youth service, there were a few disciples that desired God. And there was a place I used to go and pray on the, on the mountaintop. And they used to come and visit me there. They would wait for me when I finish my prayer. They would wait for me with their Bible. Sit down. So when I finish, then I come and I open scriptures to them. In fact, I didn't even know their names after many lectures. Because when I finish dispensing, I go. Hallelujah. But in the same city, while I was on the mountain top, I had a visitation from God and a little ounce of anointing dropped. Ooh, it was my intention to remain on the mountain top doing the secret business with God. But when the anointing came, I could no longer hide what was happening in the privacy of that mountain top, which was my prayer ground. Because from that mountain top, uh, it came to pass, it came to pass, it came to pass came to pass that I was still doing Bible study. I was on that mountain top. They came to invite me for Bible study. So I prayed. I shut down the prayer and I took my Bible and I went and that was when I discovered there was a fellowship in that vicinity where I was staying and I came to teach. I was wondering why the Holy Ghost was asking me to teach about the baptism in the spirit. It was not too long that I discovered that my congregation was orthodox. There was no Holy Ghost around. Hallelujah. So I did a brief teaching. The four steps to receiving the Holy Spirit. And my text was in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. And I said that there were two things that God did and there were two things that man did in order for this which God was offering to, be, to, to become a reality in their lives. So we took the first step, what God did. We saw it doctrinally. We saw how God was committed to ensuring that men were empowered. We saw that it was the will of God. We saw that Jesus did not want the disciples to go about preaching the gospel if they were not empowered for that kind of business. According to Jesus, if you have the right empowerment, you can do the right job. Your being suited for the job from Jesus' perspective was not a function of where you studied, what you studied, what your name is, the name of your village. It was if you had the empowerment for the job. And I did my teaching. And after the teaching, I said, where is time for practical? Because I taught them in my teaching that there's a personality, there's a priest whose responsibility it is to baptize men with the Holy Spirit. John says, I indeed are baptized you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than me. The latchet of his sanders I'm not worthy to bear. This personality, he will baptize you 
with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So I taught them how to pray so that the baptizer could come and give an impartation of what he had in quantum. And as they were praying that prayer, I also showed them that when the apostles were praying for people to connect with the Christ for baptism, he laid, they laid hands on them. So they don't, in that fellowship, they don't know what laying of hands means. They believe that if you are laying hands on people, you are transmitting witchcraft. But I had to show them from the Bible. They laid what? Their hands. Then the power of God broke out. Orthodox fellowship became Pentecostal. As the power of God broke out, there was a lady towards my left. She was not the Holy Ghost she received. She, the power of God, agitated this. The, she was a vessel for demons. There were demons that had found an abode in a vessel. And they had been there for a very long time. They had made a, a sitting room in her chambers, in a vessel. Made a kitchen. They have made arrangements to be there for a long time. They have put rock inside of her spirit man. And they were just having a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing that suggested that there was demonic activity around her life up until that time until we brought in another element he said how God what we introduced a different substance into the fellowship life and then suddenly there was a mighty agitation and the power of God was so potent that when he struck the lady she blanked out as she will breathe for some time and then breathing will be suspended. The breathing was irregular. In fact, it was so much that when the service ended, people went home rejoicing. She was still in that state. So the, the parents say, well, we know this is the power of God, but pastor, we and you will sit here until our daughter <laughs> revives. revives. You see, hallelujah, hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Now you can run church, you can run church and everybody, people that are possessed are there in the choir, among the elders. They are there in membership. In fact, they are taking over the departments and it's by the inspiration of demons that the entire system is running. Yeah. And everybody comes and says, yes, yes, Sokato, yes, Sokato, yes, Sokato. <laughs> Meanwhile, demons are everywhere. <coughs> Until we introduce another element. You can't prepare too much for that element. When it comes, it exposes. When it, it is philanthropy. And that's what Jesus was doing. The hideouts of demons. Demons could no longer stay there. He had something to throw out. And if that introduction comes into the abode, it causes quite explosions. Things are agitated. Demons that were calm suddenly begin to seize the vocal cords of men and begin to speak like ah. So we had to wait. I had to wait with the parents. And after three hours she revived. She shook like the and revived. So when she revived I, I, I took her to the corner. The strange things she told me that night, because she told me in confidence, that's why I will not say it. Here. The things they did in witchcraft. But you know what? When the philanthropist comes, if it takes you, there's no price too much to pay. If it takes you five years, go for it. When the anointing comes, you can't hide it anymore. It will speak volumes. It will speak. I, I just came from the village. I went there. My mom was excited seeing me. I said, oh, there's a program I came for. We came for a program. Yeah, dress up. Let's go. And we went there. And it began to rain. The first thing I did was I bound the rain. Because in my work with God, I have authority over the elements. Yeah, it's one of the things I do. I know how to. If you if you want, are, are you with me? 
if you if you want to do your traditional wedding, I don't want rain. Just invite me. Say, come, come. Do it in August. It will be dry. You know, when I was asking your mom to help us get the convocation square for the crusade, she said, Pastor, there's rain. I, I said, leave the rain to us. That's what we do. That's, we, that's, oh my God. So when I came there, we had to, the rain was blotted out. That's how we started our, our job. People did not come for service because of rain. So the few that came, we introduced the element. As the element was coming into the congregation, one lady took off from the congregation. Ushers had to. You know, those people were there. They, the people were there. They were in the choir. They were there. Nothing was happening. Witches. People that practiced black arts. They were in church. And they were comfortable. For so long. And God has shown me mercy. In that, I get invited. I've even preached in the Catholic church. Yes, I preached. The father finished his own side of the service and then handed the service to me. And everybody was orderly. We were very orderly when we started. And then subsequently, agitations began to take place because we introduced something. We introduced something. It was a Lent. It was a time of Lent. So they said I should not say praise the Lord in my sermon. I come as silly man. You can introduce him something. You can introduce something without saying praise the Lord. Your philanthropy can prosper without using church jargon. After the service, they gave me a note and said, "They say you said praise the Lord twice." Hallelujah. And the next day, because they gave me so many rules, so I obeyed the, the rules the first night. Don't do this, don't do this. And you know, me, I like walking. When I preach, say no, no, that's not. When you want to preach, the burden should make you <laughs> don't move. <laughs> so I tried that. I tried that for one night. And then the second night, I knew that was the last night. I introduced something there. And when the thing was introduced, it was so powerful that I, me, myself, no. I know I say praise the Lord seven times. But they didn't remember. They didn't remember. No note. And the person that was supposed to count how many times was on, on ground. Because something was introduced. Which is could keep tormenting you until you introduce something. Your neighbor's witchcraft will influence whether you pass your examinations on campus until you introduce something. When you introduce that thing, witches can't handle it. Oh, okay, in the night, we finished praying, slept, and a witch came to me in the dream. I said, So, you are the one that says, will not rest. I was just watching. Then he brought three, three witches that were shaved. That it was my prayer that shaved them. <laughs> and they were burnt. Some of them were burnt by the side. Burnt black. One, the mouth was. That, that, see, see what I did. <laughs> eh? See what I did. <laughs> I saw something like a village that was smoking with fire. I said, I'm the one that destroyed them. And you know what pain her? She said, and now, it's as if it's every day I want to be doing it. <laughs> if witches have not started appearing to you like this, you are not a philanthropist. You are not going about. You, are not, you don't have anything to give. So, there's no... In fact, they now, the, the witch now said, when they bind people 
at least I should have allowed them to suffer small so that the people will say at least they are doing something. They, them, they would have, they won't have been so angry. Then later I break the yoke. He said, <laughs> now it's every day that I claim to be doing this thing. Now, that they are going to secure new weapons. Oh. <laughs> you know what? Which is They are the basest level of terrorists. They run faster when there's opposition. But they are terrorists. That's what they do. They can appear to you and terrorize you and do some things just to confuse you. If you don't know the truth, you run away from witches. But you see, Jesus did not have problem with witches. The thing is that it was God that anointed him. His business was with God. And what God did was that God anointed him. Anointed him with the Holy Ghost. Anointed him with power. He went about doing good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Because God was with him. There is something about that verse I want to pick out. Just one thing. The Bible says that men were oppressed of the devil. That's what I want to pick out. What is oppression? He went about doing good and what? Healing all that were what? Oppressed of the devil. Why could he do that? Because God was with him. What's oppression? Is harsh control. A control that is established against the will of a person. Harsh control. Compelled control. I need to tell you a story about oppression. Because one of the things that God will be doing tonight, he'll be putting an end to oppression. If the ministry of Jesus is still continuing, if that ministry is still on today, then the anointing that was upon him, if that anointing is still here today, the same things that the anointing did on Jesus, the anointing would do upon any man that God has put it upon because God does not give you the anointing and allow you to operate it yourself. He gives you the anointing and he stays with you because God was with him. God will now attach himself to you to help you, aid you in the administration of that spiritual deposit that he puts upon your life. I've seen too many people suffer. And uh, you see, this suffering we're talking about is not because you are illiterate. It's just because God, you have not been able to sufficiently build your abode around God. And so many unfortunate things get to happen to people. Meanwhile, that's why God has anointed us. He called us and anointed us because he loves the people. So if the people have not yet gotten to a point where they can access him directly, alleviate their sorrows by the anointing. With the hope that when the yokes are broken, they will be able to find the pathway to navigate to God and find God for themselves. The purpose of the anointing is not so that you can be a superstar, an actor, a performer. But God uses that instrument to break the yokes upon men with the hope that your life will direct them to him and the relationship that he wants to establish with them through that act platform from whence he can begin to cultivate that relationship with every man, every woman walking on the streets. Hallelujah. Now, you see, the Bible says that there was this, um, if you do if you if you do microbiology and we draw your blood we'll take a sample of your blood and we subject it to a few tests and we find plasmodium fasciparum in your bloodstream hallelujah right there we develop a culture a habitat where we can that is conducive for plasmodium fasciparum that is in your blood. And then we'll begin to test 
not plasmodium. Are you with me? Are you with me? All right, we begin to test it with um, with atameta. Oh, okay, the one you know is chloroquine. We we'll test plasmodium falciparum with chloroquine, and then we we'll discover that upon administering chloroquine, it took two weeks for it to die. Is that clear? We we'll change the drug here. Another culture is here. We we'll apply, introduce another drug. Huh? We we'll introduce another drug. Then we see that um, um, what do we? Pialaxin is more effective. Because we have Plasmodium, Fasiparum, Malire, and Vivax. And some of the drugs are good for, for Vivax, some are good for Malire, some are good for Fasiparum. So when you introduce the drug, you will see the effectiveness of the drug in, in dealing with that uh, bacteria. So you now prescribe that drug and say, okay, the bacteria is sensitive to this drug, that drug. And that is what informs the doctor on the prescription that he gives. Are you with me? All right. Um, that scripture gave us an analysis of the potency of the anointing in the culture. You see how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. Healing known that we what? Oppressed of the day. It means that the anointing has high sensitivity to oppression. If it finds oppression, eh, it doesn't heal some of it. It is very sensitive to in, in fact, it is so opposed to oppression. And so if there's even a little oil on your life, a little anointing on your life, it does so much damage to oppression. So much damage. Of all the things God hates, he hates oppression so much that he made oppression so sensitive to the anointing. If the anointing should come upon the scene, oppression gives way. But many people are living in oppression and they don't know. And that's why we need to enlighten us this evening about what oppression is. Healing all that what? We're oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Number one. Turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'll do this for another 15 minutes. Then we'll begin to pray. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7 verse 7. Surely, oppression make it a wise man mad, and the gift destroy the heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. It says, Surely, that means without doubt. Without doubt, oppression make it what? A wise man mad. Now, the guy is wise. But oppression has no respect for wisdom. Imagine that someone has gone all the way to Oxford University to study. And he has come back home with a PhD in one of the sciences. He's an authority in his field. During the time of his research, he was able to publish three of his discoveries in journals, world acclaimed journals. And he's reputed for his wisdom is reputed for his skill and his discoveries have gone a long way to help humankind. That's a scholar. He has a wisdom. But the spirit of oppression has no respect for wisdom. In fact, oppression likes wise people. You can conquer the world with your wisdom and then Satan will release an oppression on your life. Whereas you are still making inventions that is helping the world, your life is a contradiction to your capacity and possibility. And if that kind of situation continues, it comes to a point where the person involved that has been used 
his skill has helped a lot of people and helped a lot of things. He himself is a reproach. He is a contradiction. And he comes to a point where he gives up. So his wisdom counted for nothing because of oppression. Just in case you have evaluated your life and you have seen a potential, a capacity in your life. A capacity that you have not been able to realize. And the more effort you put into it, uh, the more unfortunate situations find expression. And it has been consistent over the years. It's an indication that you are a specimen of oppression. Meanwhile, the anointing of the Holy Spirit happens to be sensitive in the culture, cultural media. It is sensitive to what? Healing all that way. Do you realize that the word that was used to describe the, the deliverance that comes to the oppressed is healing? He didn't say healing all that were sick. He said healing all that were because oppression can deteriorate and deteriorate like an infirmity. It can eat up the possibilities. So much so that you will come to a point you will deny that you have the ability, the grace. That it was not you that did those mighty things. Oppression. Oppression. Where you find men with so much ability but they have been incapacitated. He says, surely oppression make it a wise man mad. I remember those days, those days I was an usher in our church in the village. And there was this master's degree holder in mathematics in that church. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I heard that he used to sneak to drink star. That, that. Not in the open. In the night, under the cover of darkness, he will escape and sip star. When investigations were conducted, the reason why he goes to fellowship at the beer parlor, after fellowshiping in church, he also has another fellowship. And his wife knows that he won't come back home directly from church. So his wife will just move home because he's going to another fellowship. When an investigation was conducted, why he is this, his life is schizophrenic. He has two identities. One in church and the other one in the beer parlor. We discovered that he was so good in mathematics that he wrote books in every strange aspect of mathematics. Yes. And they were all manuscripts. But he could not publish one. But all the manuscripts were there in business mathematics. In all kinds of... And all the foreign, strange, outlawed sectors of mathematics. He has written books on those. But to translate those books into publishing. He's been attempting and failing and attempting and failing then he now he now discovered that the fellowship over a bottle of star has the potency of making him forget his numerous failures the bible says oppression make it what so our pastor now discovered and you know what our pastor did he took one of the books and he went and published it and he didn't tell him when the books came out, he called him. He said, see your books. Do you know that when that man saw those books, he stopped drinking? Do you know that Kogi State Government actually and Ministry of Education endorsed those books? The man broke mathematics down that even people that were cursed with migraine from the covens of the elementals, they read the book and their password. So each book he had in his archive was a bomb, a mathematics deliverance bomb. But he himself, as wise as he was, to translate it from manuscript to book, he meets something there. And the many, many more times he attempted and failed, there was a scar on his soul until he didn't attempt again. He found a green bottle and married himself to it. There are many people living a life that is a lie. Not because
because God has not endowed them. There is a spirit called oppression that has made them mad. But the Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. His first book made was a bestseller. So if people are going to SS1, they must buy his book. Because his, his book is a compendium from SS1 to SS3. And he breaks mathematics down so clearly. He wrote in business math. He wrote math statistics. Books in math statistics. Broke statistics down. His, three of his books were bestsellers. And when those books were published, this man, his status changed. Meanwhile, those books were not written today. They were written, some of them were written after his first degree. And he kept the manuscript. He wrote some, wrote so many things. The thing is there, but the ability to translate it was a challenge. He went looking for women, looking, he didn't find what it was. The temporary relief he had was with the star bottle. I don't know what life oppression has made you accept because you have failed for so long. You have decided to adopt that life as, uh, yeah, this is, well, I can survive like this. God did not call you to manage. He didn't call you to get by. He has a plan for you and that's why he formulated the anointing. That carriers of this grace will be instruments through which the burden of oppression might be broken from the lives of men. So oppression has the capacity to turn down the power of potential. Hallelujah. It can turn down what? The power of potential. Number two. Job chapter 35 verse 9. Job chapter 35 verse 9. Job chapter 35 verse 9. Hallelujah. He said by, the, by reason of the multitude of oppressions they make the oppressed to cry. They cry out by reason of of the arm of the mighty. Oppression has the capacity to relegate a man to a life of perpetual sorrow by reason of the multitude of, of oppression. By reason of the multitude of oppression. I met a woman recently. She's just, that is, she has been so sorrowful that she doesn't even know that her countenance has absorbed has assimilated, has, has changed to accommodate. She looks sorrowful now. Eh? Do you understand what I'm talking about? She's been so sorrowful that now she looks sorrowful. It is part of her countenance. Once you see her, you will know that this is, oh my God, all kinds of frustrations have made their way with this woman. She's looking her problem. Just like several people in the Bible that were called, named after their problem. For instance, we never got to know the name of the woman with the issue of blood. Her, her name was her problem. When they see her, they say, but that woman, that she was described, identified. Just imagine how you look like if you are the son of the woman with the issue of blood. Nameless woman that was called by her problem. Oppression has an intelligent way of putting you in perpetual sorrow with the intent that sorrow will become your identity. The anointing happens to be very sensitive to, to what? To oppression. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. I need to tell you a little about the anointing. And why the anointing happens to be very sensitive to oppression. And anywhere the oppression is locking, if the anointing comes upon the scene, it has the capacity to unveil it, to expose it, and to break it. Hallelujah. I don't know, I don't know. I don't. Most times, you know, I've been counseling people for so many years, and I'm trying to stop counseling now. The reason is because when most people come for counseling, they don't tell you the truth. They will just tell you what they want you to know. Then they bend your mind. Bend your mind in a certain way so that you can perceive them in a certain light. Meanwhile, the real issues have not been touched. 
So, because of the hypocrisy I've seen, the flaw of counseling, I have a very strong intention to shut it down in my own practice of ministry. But you see, my wise men are here and they have been counseling me. Hallelujah. That, uh, so, the way out now is I will not see anybody that have not seen my pastors. If you see them and they feel that the thing should be referred before I will see because people come there and waste time. They don't, no. They just come and deceive. Meanwhile, the, the issue, the issue, most of the time God will reveal the issue. But the person is talking far away from the issue. That's not If you want to deal with oppression and you want anointing to attack the yoke of oppression on your life, you don't hide it. When Jesus was raised from the dead and he wanted to really confirm to the apostles that he was the one, he had to show them his wounds. Say, behold, behold my hands. Put your hand and touch my side. When, when we say you should pray now, don't say our father who was in heaven. One that is so exalted in the annals of the palaces of the heavenlies. That is not, you are lost. You are, you are out of sync. You are, show your wounds. Show it. That When Jesus came to the guy that was sick for 38 years, lying by the, the side of the river, the pool, he said, "With thou be made whole." He went straight to the issue. The man said, "Oh, oh, oh!" <laughs> See, oppression has made the man not to know his need. What? <laughs> he, he, he brought another issue up. Take ah, You are not aware. You have no insight. I have no man. Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted to join himself with the man. I am, I am your man. Will die. You see, that's why a man needs to be healed from oppression. Oppression damages you. Your expectations are damaged. Your vision is damaged. And I, well, I don't know where you have been. And what made you to accept your current position. But if you need attention for oppression, one of the things I recommend is that you show your wounds just like Jesus had to show his hands. Say, just in case you think I'm a fake. Behold, Jesus was not afraid of making bare that wounded place in him. He told Thomas, put your hand there. Feel the place where the spear pierced. Many of you are still hiding where the spear pierced and you're expecting the oil to enter into that place and drive the bacteria so that your healing from oppression can begin to find expression. Please help me preach to your neighbor. Sometimes it's better when someone that is sitting by their side, preach to the person, show your wounds, show, show your wounds. We come to church and everybody is looking so wonderful. Shining white. Paramo Santa. And those, these days of all kinds of hair, eh? We don't know which one is in natural hair again. And when they wear it, why? all kinds of hair. I saw a sister one day, and then the next day she had another style. I was asking her what her name was. It was not her name that changed. <laughs> it was not her name that changed. It, the, the, the hair was... You can have that hair and oppression. Oppression can still be walking a protocol inside. When we begin to pray, don't don't put the don't do like this. No, no. see, show the unveil it. Jesus, it is here. And he's 12 years old. Can you have mercy? Don't operate like that man by the pool. He said, Hey, I have no man. Because of my experience at the poolside, I had gained discernment. When the angels are dispatched, I have, I have a gift from God. 
by which I can discern that one opportune time has come again. But you see, my my knowledge, my prior knowledge to this time of visitation is not translated to healing because he became a philosopher by the pool. But the question was simple. Will thou eh? will thou be made? Oh. There are several times Jesus will come and say, what do you want? And he was talking to a blind man. Instead of the man say, sight, sight, sight. Hallelujah. It's not as if it was not obvious that the man was blind. But if you are going to do away with oppression, you must be willing to say what you need the anointing to be directed at. What do you want? Say that I might receive my sight. Today you are going to be specific in your quest, in your request so that God's anointing can flow like a river. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. I say hallelujah. Amen. It's a privilege to walk with God. I've seen many times, many, many times where the anointing comes in such a strange fashion and all kinds of yokes are broken. Many people think the preacher is a powerful man. But there are miracles he sees that makes him humble. He knows that, you see. Hallelujah. And once and again, God begins to surprise a vessel that is yielded to him because of his urgency to reach out to a man that is operating under oppression. It is prayer time now. And we have 30 more minutes to do the business of tonight. The purpose of our meeting tonight is that yokes might be broken that people might be liberated that the grace of God might flow into quarters where the presence of God has been hindered previously uh, uh, don't joke with the next five minutes it's your opportunity to direct the power of God the grace of God to that focal point where the help of God is needed oh we have just 30 minutes to do this business if it's more convenient for you to sit, you may sit. If it's more convenient for you to stand, you may stand. Any position that is convenient for you. But by all means, make sure you trap the attention of Jesus by reaching out to him. Thou son of David. Have mercy on me. Let us Have you spotted the presence of, the presence of oppression? Of oppression. Have you conducted a diagnosis and you have discovered that demons of oppression have been hanging around your life? That's the reason for the philanthropy of Jesus. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with you. Bronze Kambola he kaske preheverato Wabriza varatos kem Abrekomba siko preza sakomba Baski tombre mali kapatama na subrea. Have you noticed a pattern in your life when you are almost there to lay hold of that which is your destiny? Then suddenly there's an interception. You have that privilege tonight to fulfill the story, to, to live out the destiny that you have been sent on errand from heaven. To manifest to upon manifest. the face of the earth, the anointing today is directed at that limitation so that you can experience the largeness that is in the grace of God. Laos Samina Sike Bronte Samakuda Leso Sama Braski Vofoto Mohe Parina Kaparasko Prela Kapanasanda. Make sure you show him your wounds. Ali
Sipping life from your vessel. The sipping life. Now I command life to come back. To come back into your vessel. I command life to come back. To come back. To come back into your vessel. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I command that your garment that was taken from you, that is used as a point of contact, let it be burnt off. Let it be burnt off anywhere it is. In the name of Jesus. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, let life be restored. Let life be restored. Yes. If you are still in the congregation, you may wish to speak in tongues for two minutes. There's a war. There's a war in the spirit. There's a war in the spirit. There's somebody listening to me online. Your name is Michael. Your name is Michael. And you have suffered oppression from the enemy. You have suffered oppression from the enemy. Today, I proclaim your liberty. Michael, be free. Presoke manseli bokoti abaratua. Prensa tesko pre. Ba 
Rico Tapala, Rico Scapani, Lebron Janeco Pate Casabono, Epreskete, Ico Taben, Rabasokena, Kila Bentali, Apreskova Sapa, Basaba, Esembele Kebo, Imelande Malade. Glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.